John chapter 7. I'm going to cover a lot. Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. He's trying to teach. It's interesting that every time Jesus tries to teach, it seems like the religious people have to come in and put their two cents in and want to try to interrupt or try to catch Jesus in something because reality is he's teaching. People are listening. Lives are being changed. But religion says, you're not doing it our way, so you must be wrong. You don't follow our rules, our regulations. You don't follow our church bylaws, so how dare you? Who do you think you are? And they're constantly going after Jesus, constantly antagonizing him. And Jesus, having grace and mercy, let them continue to do it. I think if I would have been Jesus, I would have just zapped them all. That would have been it. It would have been over. I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. I could have just went and taken my place where I was supposed to be at and killed them all. But then we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't have the opportunity that we have. Because Jesus is not selfish. I'd be selfish because I can't stand people like that. They irritate me. But, to the love of Christ, I have to love them. And that's why we're in the series of Ren, is love overcoming sin. Because reality is, this is what Jesus was doing. By every act that he did, every word that he spoke, he was overcoming the sin that was presented to him. He was overcoming the sin of religion. He was overcoming the other sins that were presented to him, of selfishness, idolatry, all these different things that were put before him. He was overcoming that by love. Well, Pastor, I mean, if you read Jesus, sometimes it seems like he was being very harsh. He was being harsh. But he wasn't doing it to be cruel. He wasn't doing it just to be mean. There's a difference between being harsh and stern and firm with somebody in a corrective way and just being mean. Is that fair? Because there's a definite difference. There's a definitive difference. It's like disciplining your children. There's those that discipline their children and those that beat their children. There's a difference. There's a difference in correction and abuse. Jesus, out of love, was correcting false teaching and lies, and he was bringing people back to relationship with God. And Jesus, as it goes through chapter 7, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I encourage you to do so. But we see this at the festival of the booths or tabernacle. It's time when they were traveling, doing their thing. And Jesus is getting mocked by his brothers. And they're, you know, it's like, well, look, if you're so high and mighty and you're all this and all that, I'm going to go up and show off a little bit, you know. You don't just hide stuff like that. Everyone else, they go up and they show off, so why don't you go do the same thing? You see that at the beginning, Jesus said, no, it's not my time yet. It's not the right time. It's not time for me to be there. And they go on without him later on, he ends up showing up anyway. Jesus knows exactly when he's supposed to be where he's supposed to be and how he's supposed to be. He knows exactly what he's supposed to be doing. How does he know that? Because he communes with the Father regularly. He spends time with his Heavenly Father through prayer and just communion, just talking with his dad. And he gets there and they're teaching and everybody starts questioning. See, in verse 15, it starts off, or excuse me, 14, it starts there. It says, Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. It's interesting. Jesus always went to the temple and taught in the <coughs> temple. It wasn't like he was doing something out in the middle of nowhere. You know, it wasn't like he was trying to draw people to He was going to the place of what? Teaching. The place of learning about God. And he was going in there and he was teaching. It wasn't like it was open, you know, Mike, Sunday at the temple. It was, if you were a teacher, you could go in and teach. They viewed Jesus as a teacher. So they let him teach, but... Because of what he was teaching, what the authority was teaching, it began to rub people the wrong way. See, we're in the time of year where all the whack jobs want to come out and all the religious people want to come out and they want to start persecuting Christmas and this and that and everything else. All of it was based off of pagan holidays, based off the winter solstice, this, this, and everything else. And we're not supposed to be doing that. We're not supposed to be incorporating this. We're not supposed to be incorporating that. If you look at Deuteronomy, if you look at Leviticus, if you look at... They bring in the law. Which is fine if you want to bring in the law. I get that. You understand scripture. I appreciate where you're going. However, if you're going to bring in the law, the New Testament says if you're going to keep the law, you have to keep the entire law. 620 plus rules and regulations of the Old Testament that you have to keep. So if you're going to preach it, 
and expect people to keep it, then you better be keeping it yourself. All of it. So they want to nitpick the laws and stuff that they choose to go with. And no different with the Pharisees, we'll see in a few minutes. They want to take part of the law, not all the law, and they want to twist it to fit their own means to try to get somebody in trouble or try to make them feel bad or guilty. They know what like, religious people like to do. They like to make those that are free, those that you know are living under the grace of Jesus instead of the rules and regulations of religion, and they're, they're having a life with Jesus, which is totally awesome, and then you got the religious people come in, well, you can't do it like that. I've been at this longer than you have. You don't know what you're doing. It's basically what they were trying to tell Jesus. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so Jesus is teaching, and Jews marvel, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Because he didn't go to school with the rest of them. They were kind of wondering, like, how do you know what you know? How do you do what you do? You don't have a diploma. You don't have a degree. <clears throat> how, do you, how, how are you able to do what you're doing? And the interesting people don't understand something, they, they're, they're the first to start tearing it down just because they don't understand. Or they believe that their way is the only way. If you're like that and you believe that your way is the only way, then you need to go back and look at what Jesus said. Jesus says, I am the way. So Jesus' way is the only way. He says, I am the truth. It's singular. He's the only truth. He says, I am the life. He's the only way to have life. So it's not your way, it's his way. Learn it. Follow that, and you're going to be a lot better off. And Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Jesus here does not take credit to himself. He's, he's always pointing back to the Father. It's not me. It's Dad. You take it up with him. So if anyone wills to do his will, talking about the Father's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Basically what? If you want to push your own agenda, you're seeking your own glory, your own building up, your own puffing up. How many preachers out there today that are basically... There, so they can be seen and be heard. There's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of these guys, man. It, it is. It's all about them. It's. It's not about Jesus. It's all about look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Even Jesus pointed back to who? God. It's all about God. It's all about Dad. It's all. We need to focus back to Him. Everything we do should be focused back to Him. And He makes it very clear. If you're speaking of your own accord, it's for your own glory. It's not for the glory of God. You're not building up the kingdom. You're building up your kingdom. Guess what? Your kingdom is going to fall. It's going to fail. Sooner or later, it's going to be destroyed. And I pray that you're not caught in the rubble when it goes down. Because it will destroy you. And he goes on. And verse 9 says, Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? Jesus knew what their hearts were. He knew what they were about. He knew what they intended to do to him, what they desperately wanted. They needed to shut him up. And they made a good point, you know, about the, you know, the football players wanting to give glory to God for everything that was going on. CNN cut him off halfway through what he was saying. He was trying to give God glory for everything that was happening, and they, they cut away from him just as quick as possible. You know, if that had been somebody from another faith, they would have let him continue in his little spiel just because, you know, they don't want to offend them. But the world doesn't want to hear someone give glory to God. Especially if they're in a secular setting, if you will, if you want to differentiate between the two. Someone giving glory to the Father. It bothers them. It gets under their skin. We're going to see why. We'll see it here in the passage. But it just oh, it irks them. It's like nails on a chalkboard. It's like those Brillo pads that goes over people's nails. <sighs> Noise. It's me chills just thinking about stuff. Ugh. It just bothers them. You ever have somebody in your life that as soon as they open their mouth, you automatically cringe? Okay? There's just, there's just certain people, as soon as they begin to speak, you're like, you automatically, your body starts doing things uncontrollably. You're like, shut up, shut up. I don't want to hear you. Shut up. This is what it was for the religious people when Jesus started speaking. They knew that one, all eyes come off of them. I've known people in my past that whenever the eyes got turned from them, they had to do something to get the eyes back on them. 
And those people that have to be the center of attention at all times, those people are annoying. Because they will do stupid stuff just to get the attention back on them. Foolish things just to get the attention back on them. Now mind you, Jesus has told them that Moses gave you the law. They're supposed to be what? Teachers of the law. They're supposed to be the ones that are handling that and you know, dividing it up like it's supposed to be and make sure people understand it. Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Now catch this in verse 20. The people answered and said, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. They completely ignored the fact Jesus said you're not even following your own law. They're just going, oh, 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 who's seeking to kill you? Jesus had a nerve. He called them on the intent of their heart. It's like, oh, 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 oh. We, we talk, you're crazy. What's the first thing that you do whenever somebody calls you on something that you're doing? Or that you maybe you've been thinking about doing, you try to put off. You know what we're talking about. Come on now. That's nuts. I, I never, I would never do that. And you got your fingers crossed behind your back, your toes are crossed in your shoes, you're doing everything you can say, so I'm not lying. Twitch, twitch. We got a friend of ours that comes here to trail whenever he tells a fib. <laughs> His eyebrow twitches. Funniest thing ever. It does. If he tries to tell a story, he knows it's a story. And you look that at him, his eyebrow sure enough will twitch. <laughs> what is that? But what? You're going to put up a front because you don't want to be called out on your true intent. You're going to try to cover it up. You're going to try to hide it. They totally ignored the fact Jesus just called them on the fact they don't keep the law. And said, no, no, we don't want to kill you. It goes on, verse 21, says, I did one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision that is not from Moses but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. So what, what did Jesus do? He healed somebody on the Sabbath. He ticked the religious people off by doing a good work on the Sabbath because he wasn't supposed to work. I would say circumcising somebody is work for them and for the baby. That's work. <laughs> That's work. Okay, there's things that have to happen at that point in time. It's not good. But they're mad at Jesus for doing something good. Which circumcision was something good as well. So y'all done caught up on circumcision. So you know that God circumcised your heart and get rid of that stuff that's in there that's causing you problems. It goes on. Because they were trying to judge by their own rules, regulations, their own religion. How often do we keep people out of church because we want to try to get them to follow our way of doing things instead of God's way? How many people leave churches because the church says, no, you have to do it our way? You have to dress like us. You have to talk like us. You have to wear your hair like us. You have to not do certain things. And this is the only way you're going to be accepted into our group. That's kind of what was going on here. Jesus says, you're judging based on appearance in verse 24. He said, but if you're going to judge, even give something out. If you're going to judge, judge according to what? Righteous judgment. Righteousness. Let it be, your judgment be Righteous. Not based off your opinion. <coughs> Part of the rant I went on this week whenever I put on Facebook about Christmas sucking, I put on, I said, Christmas sucks. To a degree, it does. Why? Because all those stupid people come out and want to cause problems for this time of year when you could be using it as an awesome tool to point people to Jesus. You got the people that want to detract from that and cause distraction, which is exactly what the enemy would love to do instead of keeping the focus on Christ and making it you know what, this is an opportunity we get to talk about the amazing gift that God gave us. His son. Was he born in December? No. We know he wasn't born in December. We know he wasn't born December 25th. We know that. People go stupid over things like this. He was born late September, early October. Okay, change. It's about the time he was born. We don't have a specific date. But if we were to be mindful about it, we could probably go back and figure it out. But who cares? The fact is, we have an opportunity to talk about the gift of life that was given to us. But people want to go stupid over stupid details. People want to be judgmental. Instead of folks, you know what, this is a great time. They want to say, well, it's of the devil. Everybody remember the water boy? That's of the devil. Mama said, that's of the devil. He just went off. Everything was of the devil. Now, granted, some of the stuff I can get, yeah, kind of was. But everything for her was up to the devil. Why? Because she was trying to protect her baby. Don't mess with that. It's up to the devil. Don't do that. It's up to the devil. The devil's going to get you. 
Here's the bad thing. People do this with God. God's going to get you. You do that, God's going to be mad at you. Though we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So anytime anybody continually wants to throw God in there, you know, that you know God's going to be mad at you, God's going to destroy you, God's going to... He might, but if it doesn't get backed up with the Word of God, then just stay off of it. If we understand the Word of God says, look, you know, those liars, thieves, adulterers, all these things are going to have their place in the lake of fire, that's true. It's going to happen. We shouldn't participate in those things. But if we're going to judge, let's make sure we judge according to God's Word. And when we pass judgment, we're doing it according to God's Word, not according to our own preferences. Let's make sure it's a righteous judgment that people can come to Christ and not come to condemnation where they run from God. They should be drawing near to God, not the other way around. And he goes on, and he begins to speak all these other things. It's just stupid things are happening over and over and over again. Some people begin to believe because of his tenaciousness and his boldness with which he's speaking. How many times do people follow speakers because of the way they move them. Why do people go to Tony Robbins? Anybody ever know who Tony Robbins is? If you don't know, he's a motivational speaker. Very good at what he does. Very well paid for what he does. Okay? But people flock to him because he's able to move them with their words. Churchill could move people with his words. Very prolific speaker. But get this. Hitler could move people with his words. What was it that moved nations? Was it Hitler himself, or was it what he was speaking and people got on board with it and they all kind of got involved? Moving people. Jesus was changing people. Changing people's lives. You see, in verse 31, that's exactly what was happening. And many of the people believed in him and said, when Christ comes, he will do more signs than these which this man has done. They're asking, okay, because the Pharisees were saying one thing. The people were seeing Jesus. They were seeing the works. I like simple people. They just take it at face value and see what it is. Like, wow, that's not for me. Then you got the religious people who want to bring up all stupid details that one have nothing to do with the truth. But you see here, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. And Jesus said, I shall be with you. He goes on this whole thing. about He's going to be there for a little while. And he's going to be gone. You can't go with him. And then they were asking whether he intended to kill himself. These people have an interesting mindset. Jesus is speaking spiritual truth to them, and they think he's lost his mind. It happens, that's verse 35. Verse 36, you'll seek me, not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. So he continued on, he didn't even give them an opportunity. Verse 37, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is the promise that Jesus made. Again, he's speaking of the promise of the Holy Spirit, which was yet to come. But he was putting it out there now. What was Jesus doing? He was sowing seeds of an expectant harvest. He knew what was to come. And he goes on again. These people just went nuts over this. Jesus was causing all kinds of problems for the religious people. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to arrest him. It wasn't his time. Understand this. In your life, God's not going to allow anything to happen in your life unless it's time for it to happen. Now, you can do things outside of the will of God and cause things to happen. But when things are meant to happen, it's not going to happen until it's meant to happen. Until God has or for it to be ordained for you to happen, it's not going to happen until then. Now, again, you can mess around. Pregnancy is one of those things. God may not have intended you for you to have something, but you can get outside of his will and cause things to happen because what? Biology works. Period. However, if you wait on the Lord, things will happen exactly in the time and season they're supposed to happen, and you'll be blessed. It's those things that happen outside of God's will and timing that cause problems. Not that God can't redeem it. He absolutely can but why go through the problem and the process of having to deal with that? We're dealing with Islam now because of someone acting outside of God's plan. Thousands of years later. But God says, what? All right, you know what? I'm going to take care of you too. And your descendants are going to be just as numerous. 
Because someone said, you know what? I don't trust God. I don't trust what he says. I'm going to do my own thing. Now look at the problems we're dealing with today. So be mindful. Don't be that person. Now again, Jesus is still teaching. He's still staying there. He's, he's been teaching there for the week. We're going into chapter 8 now. Jesus goes back into the temple. He's teaching again. The scribes and Pharisees come to him and bring a woman that has been caught in the very act of adultery. Somebody was peeking in somebody's window and watching what was going on. Okay? Now, mind you, here's the thing. They bring the woman caught in the act of adultery. And they question Jesus. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? Talking about the woman they caught in the act of adultery. The woman couldn't very well be committing the act of adultery without somebody else being there. So again, they want to take this, the law and manipulate it to their own passage and their own meaning because somebody else should have been brought before Jesus too if they were going to do this. But don't they just brought the woman? My question is, who was the guy? Maybe he was a friend. Maybe he ran away. Maybe he didn't want to realize maybe it was one of them. So there's a lot going on here. But Jesus, not responding to their foolishness. You know, sometimes the, the Proverbs talks about the worst thing you do is respond to a fool sometimes. Because then you just go to his level. I'm glad Jesus responds the way he responds. He doesn't stoop to the level. He doesn't get all fired up. He doesn't, oh, yes, she needs to die. Let's get on with it, whatever. He just stoops down and begins to write in the sand. They're coming to him with serious accusation and Jesus is doodling. Could you imagine? Here you are, a person in charge, and you're coming to someone who says thanks or somebody, and you're trying to see where they're at, trying to test them, trying to push them, and they just blow you off. Doodling. They're trying to, you know, you're upset with your spouse and you're trying to get something accomplished, and your spouse kind of looks at you and just starts drawing. How upset would you be at that moment? I'd be pretty ticked off. But see, Jesus, knowing their hearts, said, you know what? I'm not even going to stoop to your level. What I am going to do is I'm going to play in the sand. <laughs> we don't know what Jesus wrote in the sand. There's a lot of speculation. Maybe he was writing down sins of the people that were there. Maybe he was just doodling. Who knows? <laughs> but he keeps on and they continued to ask him. And he stood up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. So if any one of you here have kept the law, basically, you be the first one to throw the stone. Anybody? Any, anybody want to throw a stone on this woman? One by one. Now see, when he said this, he stoops down again and starts writing in the sand. This to me is a funny situation. Because they keep bothering me. Keep it. You know, I hate when I'm doing something and I'm trying to enjoy myself. Somebody keep on interrupting me when I'm doing something. Jesus. Doing it in the sand. He responds and goes back to doodling in the sand again. So they were convicted by their own conscience, verse 9, and they one by one went out from the oldest to the least. And Jesus was left alone with the woman. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Now, mind you, she was caught in the act of adultery. She was dragged out publicly. He was in the temple teaching. She was dragged before everybody. All the accusers disappeared, though. All those wanted to run their mouth. Isn't it funny when you call someone's bluff? How quickly they back down? How stupid they look and how quickly they leave? She looked around and said, no, I don't see no one. And Jesus looks at her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So all this again happening while Jesus is teaching. People trying to be stupid and interrupt Jesus while they're teaching, while he's teaching. And he goes right on after this. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Here's the thing again for discipleship. Anyone that follows Christ will not walk in 
darkness. This is a key element of determining, again, where you are at in Him. Because there are those that say they love Jesus, but continue to walk in darkness. They walk in spiritual darkness, because they ain't got a clue what's going on. They think they know what's going on because they go to church. They think they know what's going on because they know a few scriptures. But their life has nothing to do with God. Their walk has nothing to do with God. It's intentional. It's on purpose. How many people have you met that are like that? And it's, it, it's not, again, to judge them, but it's, it's heartbreaking. Because when you do have the love of God in you, and you see these people doing these things, your heart goes out to them. It's like, why do you continue to follow darkness Whenever Jesus offers you life, he offers you peace, he offers you hope, he gives you all these things. If you'll accept him and truly believe in him, not just play this game, oh yeah, I'm a believer. Even the demons believe in God and they fear and tremble. You walk around like you're, you're something and think you're, you're, you're God. See, whenever the love of God comes in you, there's humility that comes. He says, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Again, what's coming out in your life? What are you doing? What is being seen by others? Is it the love of God or is it the love of self? Is it the love of the world? Is it the love of something other than God? What have you placed in priority over God? Because how you live, how you react, that's going to be... The indicator of what's what. Now, verse 31. I'm going to jump down quite a few verses. If you want to read it, read what's in between. This was the theme verse for us to share at our men's retreat. Jesus said, If you abide in my word, and you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Shall set you free. The idea of abiding is to stay. To be permanently rooted, grounded. To find your life source. In your sustenance, everything you need—that's that, to abide. You know, we, we talk about well, you know our abode. Welcome to my humble abode. What are you talking about? Your house, where you live. Jesus said, "If you live in me." And then interesting word—the word "if" is probably the biggest word in scriptures because it opens up a whole other door that you have to look at. If you abide in my word, and you are my disciples indeed. What do you say? In deed. What do you mean? In action. You are his disciples in what you do. Not what you say. A lot of people run their mouths. Not many people do. Or what they are doing has nothing to do with Christ. So you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. We read earlier Jesus was talking to the, the Pharisees like, look, if you're of God and you're doing the will of God, then my doctrine will be proof enough. You'll know that it's from God. You'll know that it's not from me. Jesus here said, if you know and you will live in me, you're my disciples, you live that way, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And he goes on in verse 3, the Pharisees say, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free. And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. If you continue... Now the idea of committing sin here is not so much, again, that you made a mistake. is that you continue in it. That you do it on purpose. Instead of a practicing Catholic, you're a practicing sinner. Okay? And that goes into a whole other litany of things. But... Whatever you do is what you're a slave of. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. The slave's not always going to be there. That's not their house. Sooner or later, they're going to be moved on. Here's the thing. You'll find that in people in churches. Sooner or later, because they just don't seem to get it together, they'll move on. Then what they'll do is because they think they have this, this form of righteousness, They'll go to another church. Then they'll badmouth the church they just came from. Why well, it wasn't being fed, or this wasn't happening, or that was happening. Now, sometimes there's legitimate reasons why people leave and 
what they're saying may be true. But most of the time, whenever people leave, it's because they weren't having their ears tickled. They weren't being made to feel good about what they were doing. They were allowed to, you know, they weren't allowed to continue in their sin, and they felt guilty about their sin. And they didn't like the pastor talking about their sin from the pulpit because somehow somebody told the pastor everything that was happening in their life, and now the pastor was talking about them from the pulpit. So that made them feel uncomfortable, and they had to leave. And they blamed the pastor, and they blamed the people, and everybody else. Instead of looking in the mirror and saying, you know what, it might have been my fault. So there's people that are slave to sin. It's very difficult to remain in the house of the Lord and fellowship with believers because they're still a slave to somebody else. They're not a slave to Jesus. Eventually, they're going to move on. And rally is in the end. We're going to find out those that are with God and those that aren't. I talked about on Wednesday night about the rapture. What happens whenever you're standing next to somebody and the rapture takes place and maybe you're the one left? And you thought you were a believer and you thought you were a Christian and you thought you were all these other things because of you know what mom and daddy said and you know what the pastor said, but you never made it real for you. All of a sudden, boom, they're out of here. What do you do? Were you set free through Jesus Christ or are you still bondage to sin? What do you do? Each one of us has the opportunity today if you've already done it, then great. But reaffirm who you are in Christ and know that you know that you know. Settle it that you are saved. That you've accepted Christ as Lord and here, not here. Goes on, says, therefore, if a son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Talking about the Son of God. He goes on and says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Remember what I said earlier why sometimes people get uncomfortable? Why people get angry? Why people don't like the truth? I talked about this last night with somebody. People don't like the truth because it's not in them. And when they hear it, it bothers them. Because truth exposes things. Truth is a just a giant spotlight that just beams down on sin and falseness. And guess what? The darkness will try to do what the Bible says? Hide. Or like they do on CNN, they'll cut to something else. The Communist News Network. He goes on, he says, I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. <laughs> Jesus, calling it like it is. And some people think, well, you shouldn't call people and do things like that. Oh, yeah. Jesus says some things that most pastors would never say to people because they believe that they're too holy to do that, that a good believer shouldn't do that. Jesus says all kinds of things. He said, I know you're the descendants of Abraham, but he's not your father. The answer was said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Well, Abraham's my dad. No, no, no. No, I know who your daddy is. I tell you who your daddy is by the way you act. So those of us that have kids in this room, we can identify who their parents are if we know their parents. And their characteristics, because we'll see those characteristics in the kids. And how the kids act, parents, you ain't got no one to blame but yourself. If you don't like it, look to yourself first. Because the reality is, they've probably seen something in you, and guess what they're doing? They're being you. But the difference between that and where you and where they're at, they amplify it. So it's not like it's a little bit of you or just like you. No, no, no. It's you plus. So, if you don't like what your kids are doing, remember, anyway, he calls out who their father is, and it's pretty funny. He says, what's in Abraham? You take all this pride about Abraham being your daddy. No, 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 no. And I know who your daddy is. <laughs> mm. He said, you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Now, mind you, he still hasn't said who their daddy is yet. See, it wasn't originally your mama. It was Jesus saying it was your daddy. 
He said, that, you know, the mama jokes where everybody used to get mad, girl mama. Everybody got all offended. Uh, Jesus started the whole thing. He said, it wasn't your mama, it was your daddy. This is too funny. They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have no father, or we have one father, God. Now, mind you, they're, they're picking on Jesus now because they're saying that because Jesus and Joseph weren't married at the time, and then Jesus was a product of them having relations outside of marriage, not realizing that it had nothing to do with Joseph. Joseph just had to listen and do what God said to do, and so did Mary. So they're basically saying his mom was a whore, for a better term. And I said he was the son of a whore. She's okay. <laughs> I got you on that one. If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and come from the father. I said, now you're talking about my daddy. I'm going to tell you who my daddy is. And you're talking about where I come from. You're talking about my background. Let me tell you where I come from. I come from God. It says, nor have I come of myself, but he who sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. So people get upset with me sometimes because I'll ask questions and I'll answer it. I'll answer the question I asked you. Jesus did the same thing. He asked the question, he answered it himself. I'll tell you why you can't understand me. Because you're not able to hear it. You're not able to receive it. You are your father. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning that does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Basically, he just got said that he was a child of fornication. He just told them that basically their mother slept with the devil. And that's what they're the product of. So Jesus said, you want to talk about where people come from? Let's talk about where you come from. You want to talk about my mama? Let me talk about where you come from. Your mama slept with the devil. Hmm. Now tell me Jesus doesn't get people's faces sometimes. Jesus isn't bold, according to some people. Some people think Jesus was this passive guy, you know, kind of like Gandhi, that just, mm, all peaceful and everything else, and walked around, you know. Mm -hmm. While Jesus loved everybody, he also loved people enough to tell them the truth so that they would understand. Sometimes he was very bold and very direct with them. Remember what Paul did to the church at Corinth? He's like, look, you'll accept a fool in what he says, and now I have to act like a fool because that's what you'll accept? Then that's what I'll do. Jesus said, you want to go down this road? I'll go down this road with you so you'll hear what I'm saying. So people get upset with what some pastors say. Unfortunately, there's one pastor that resigned his position as lead pastor because he offended some people because of what he said. Here's reality. What he said was the truth. But because it was very harsh, people got offended. I happen to agree with what he said. I believe there are a lot of weak, sissy men out there that are absolutely pathetic when it comes to being a man. It's just reality. There are more of a woman than they are of a man. That's just reality. And people may not like that, and I really don't care whether they like that or not. I'm not trying to please them. I'm trying to please my father. I'm not here to please religious people. You may not like the way I teach. You may not like the way I share the word of God. I'm not trying to please you. I'm not here for you. I wasn't called by you. I was called by God to do this. And he told me to be me. So guess what? You're going to get who I am. Who God called me to be. And I'm going to speak the way God calls me to speak. If that offends you, take it up with God. Because if I'm speaking truth, then that's on you. Now if I'm speaking a lie, guess what? That's on me. And I'll have to deal with it. But if it's the truth, you have to deal with it. If the shoe fits, you better wear it. Jesus said, you're the son of the devil. That's where you come from. He said, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Then draw. Remember what happened when Stephen, whenever Stephen began to speak, they got so mad at him, they actually went up and like bit him. You gotta be pretty angry to just go and bite somebody. I mean, that's, that's pretty messed up. 
Could you imagine what just went through every one of them at that moment in time that they're trying to accuse Jesus? And he said, you don't hear me because you're not of God. But we have all the God t-shirts and we got all the symbols and we, you know, we got the Torah around our neck and we got the, you know, the, we got everything on there. We got Moses' rod and we got the symbol of the Ten Commandments on the back of our camels. I mean, come on. We're godly people. We're the teachers. Who do you think you are? We went to synagogue. We went to temple. Where did you go? Mr. Manger Boy. Who do you think you are? Mr. Carpenter. Yeah, we are, we are the elite. You're a nobody. You came from Nazareth. Not really. Where you happen to live. He was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, which was prophesied that's where he would come from. Hey! Well, see, he was speaking truth and they couldn't hear it. When people live a lie so long, and they propagate a lie so long, when the truth does come, they won't receive it, and then they get offended by it. And then they get angry. They may also know the truth, and because it's the truth, it angers them. Because they know that it's not happening in their life. They go on, says, the Jews answered and said to him, do, you, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. He goes on, then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? So I told you to ask him, who do you think you are? Verse 54, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. If I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I think Jesus got a little fired up here at the end. He said, you want to talk about Abraham? See, they're all like, well, Abraham's dead. Mm -mm. Jesus later on in another text says, He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not was, is. And he tells them right then, and he uses the name that God gave in the Old Testament, or what we view as the Old Testament, for himself, was I am. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Some people say if Jesus was just so commonplace, he was able to pass right through them. Jesus on a platform where everybody can see him. He just made this statement and is able to hide himself and pass right through them. I don't see that happening very easily if they already know what he looks like and is very easy to identify because everybody was focused on him at this point. I believe very ardently this was a supernatural event that happened here. Jesus hid himself and passed through the midst of them. These people were picked up stones ready to kill him. And he hid himself and passed through them. My question to you is, how great is your love? How bold is your love? Are you willing to confront sin? Some of us, well, I'm not very confrontational. You are, but you choose what you're confrontational over. There are certain things that you will not back down from. You will fight tooth and nail for my question is, why don't you fight for the truth of God's word? Why don't you stand up to sin and fight for what is right and be bold? When it's time to be bold in the face of your accusers, in love, not just so you can be belligerent and prove a point, 
but in love and speak the truth and let the truth come forth. Even if it means your life. Because according to Jewish tradition, they had every right to stone him at that point because that was blasphemy. To say that he was God. For mere man to say he was God. That was grounds for immediate termination. Literally. And remember in the end, that's ultimately why they killed him. Because they said he was God. How can a man say that he is God? He was murdered. He was set up on false accusations from false accusers at a time whenever the court should have never convened. Everything about that whole trial was messed up. And they went on, they asked him, you know, do you say there's a God? And what, as you said, I am. He did not deny who he was. And it's funny because over and over again in the scriptures, people say, well, Jesus never said he was God. Have you read the scriptures? Over and over and again, he said he was. But over and over again, he always was with love. Sometimes he was very passionate. Sometimes very bold, like here with the Pharisees. Basically said that your mom shagged the devil and you're a product of that. Said you guys are liars. You don't follow the law that you supposedly teach. You don't know God. You're not of God. Jesus was very bold. But sometimes with certain people, you have to be a certain way or they're not going to hear you. To the humble, you give what? Grace. And you shower them with grace. But to the prideful, you give the law. Is the law biased? Does the law play favorites? Does the law try to cause people and say, it's okay? Or is the law very direct whether you want to hear it or not? The law is very cut and dry whether you want to hear it or not. You may not like it, but there it is. Jesus says, okay, you want to go down this road, we're going to go down this road, I'm going to put it in your face, and what are you going to do with it? So if Jesus is speaking to you this morning, are you on the side of the Pharisee? Where you think you have all the answers? Or are you on the side of the one that was accused and said, you know what? i, I got to have Jesus or nothing. There's a lot that happens in these two chapters. But you need to understand with Jesus, even though he was addressing them very, very firmly, in a way that most people said, well, Jesus would never act like that. Here it is in red and black. Or black and white if you have some of the Bibles that don't have red in it. How do you address people? How do you address sin in your own life? Can you be as bold as Jesus was with the Pharisees and address the sin in your life? Because Jesus said, what, well, you need to take care of what? The beam that's in your own eye first before you take care of the speck of dust that's in somebody else's? I want to encourage you and challenge you to address the sin in your life just as boldly as Jesus addressed these Pharisees so that when you do go out, you can confront sin boldly and effectively with truth. And God will get glory because the testimony that you give, the doctrine that you're teaching is not your own. It's his doctrine. It's his word. It's his power. It's his authority. It's all based on Jesus. I love you guys. Jesus loves you. He would that everybody would come to him. Our goal is to reach the unreached and connect the unconnected. The only way we do that is through love. But there's also times we've got to be bold. We've got to stand for what is right. We've got to fight for what is right. If the believers don't fight, there's a time. What do we see in the Old Testament? To everything, there's a season. There's a time. But we should wait on the Lord's leading, the Holy Spirit in us, to lead us, to guide us, direct us the way He wants us to go. But that lives will be changed through us. If you're a closet Christian, it's time to come out. Okay? Everyone else is doing it. Why not the Christians? Let the true Christians come out. Because I find it very difficult for anybody to say that they're you know, a Christian and they hide their faith to be a Christian. Because if God's the light in us, how do you hide that light? Love people. Love God. Be obedient to His Word.
Let him change your life and let him change the lives of those around you. I want to encourage you, if you've got family members that don't know Christ, love them. Love them. Don't compromise your faith, but love them. Continue to preach the word of God. Talk about God. Let God be just part of who you are, every part of your conversation. Either they'll get on board or they'll leave you alone. Either way, honor God first above all else.